Good morning. Scripture reading today is Galatians 5, 19 through 25. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and democracy, idolatry, <clears throat> and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factors, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against, <clears throat> against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the provo <clears throat> provoking and envying, envying each other. And so be it. phone and now I don't know what it's done. He is jealous for me. Love like a hurricane. I am a tree. Have you ever been in a hurricane? You know, there's categories of hurricanes. The, big, the bigger the number, the higher the intensity. If you're not well grounded, even a tree will be uprooted. But see, if you're grounded in Jesus, you'll be blown away. You will be uprooted as far as that goes. Because there is no law against love, against patience, against any of the things that Merle talked about there that are good. We don't need laws for that. Because we are acting as Christ acts. We know the love of God and that He is jealous for us. That He loves us so, so much. And if we realize that, then as I've entitled this sermon, because it spoke out to me as we was reading through Acts, we wouldn't have a problem with jealousy and envy anymore, would we? Because see, those are the opposite things. Those are the things of the flesh. And when jealousy is unchecked, even though jealousy is not a bad thing, we'll talk about that, then sometimes envy comes after that. Then after envy comes lying, stealing, cheating, killing, whatever it might be. So as we look today at this scriptures, and we talk about that, think about that in your life. Do you have any envy that needs to be taken care of? Or do you love unconditionally because God loves you so unconditionally? If the Spirit is not blowing you away like a hurricane, then all you've got to do is get on your knees and let God blow you away. As the song and movie that we're seeing next week decides, He truly is indescribable. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for the time that we can come together and worship you. Lord, open our hearts and minds and our ears to know you more. To know that your love is indescribable, unfathomable. That you love us so much and you want us to love as Christ loved us. Even willing to lay down our lives for one another. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I did entitle this message, Jealousy and Envy. I had Merle read what was the acts of the flesh, and you might have saw jealousy and envy in there. And what was the fruit of the Spirit. Because as the Spirit fills you more and more, there will be more and more fruit. 
And I don't know about you, but I like a big, luscious, ripe piece of fruit. It's better than a semi, right? I mean, you go look at, how many of you like to pick out your pineapples? I know. Do you pull the things on the top? Is that how you do it? Do you look for yellow? We all have different ways. But you cut into one and it is just ripe and juicy. It's the most wonderful thing. If you eat one in Hawaii right off the tree, (laughs) it is really a wonderful thing. It'll blow you away how much better it is there. But we want our fruit to be so overwhelming that everyone sees our good works and glorifies our Father in heaven. From visualtheosaurus.com, jealousy and envy have very similar meanings and are often confused. In many ways, the difference is whether you have some claim on the object of your desire. You get that? This is a secular uh, definition. Whether you have some claim on the object of your desire. God is jealous for me because He has a claim on me if I am His child, if I belong to Him. And He wants to love me and He wants me to love others and He wants me to be like Him. That's why He gives me His Spirit so that I will become more and more like Christ. As I read His Word, I am getting sanctified through and through. So that's why I said earlier when Barry said, if you're reading, I know everyone's reading. We're going to go through the New Testament this year. There's not a lot of churches that do that, and I'm not bragging here. I'm just saying we will. We will go through the New Testament reading, and then we'll talk about it on Sunday. We talk about it on Friday nights when we have men's group because we don't bring a topic, and guess where the topic winds up so much. What I was reading this week, so we're talking about it. We're doing the things that are described in the Church of Acts. Before long, we'll be selling our houses and dividing them up maybe. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what we'll be doing. Jealous is defined as very watchful or careful in guarding or keeping. Because, see, God wants to keep you. If you men start flirting around with my wife, I am jealous. And rightfully so. No one would, would condemn me for that. Okay? What I do with that is a different story. But, of course, I am jealous for my wife because I love her. Envy is defined as a feeling of discontent and ill will because of another's advantages, possessions, etc. Resentful dislike of another who has something that one desires. See the difference? Jealousy has stronger emotions attached. It's no coincidence that jealous comes from the word zealous, if you didn't know that while you're reading. It can very well be the same word. That you are full of zeal, excited in everything because of the love that you have. It means ardent devotion. And remember, this is a secular description. The first uses of jealous in English were attached to biblical devotion. (laughs) Then it was applied to lovers. Because see, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Envy, on the other hand, is more like want and desire than zeal. It's sometimes considered a nice word for jealousy. The biblical sin, though, is envy, not jealousy. So you have to be even careful in our interpretations, how we're reading that word. In the New Testament, the Greek word zelo can be transworded as zeal, zeal, zealous, zealous. I'll get it right in a minute. See, Merle, I can do it too. Jealous. Remember the Theosaurus definition of resentfully envious, to burn with a desire to have. He is jealous for me, like a tree in a hurricane. If you will let him, he will blow you away with his love. That's a very popular Christian worship song nowadays. We don't sing it enough, we need to do it more. But it's also a song that has gone under complete criticism because some people don't like to think that God loves us that much, that we're not being reverent enough. (laughs) I want to tell you, in my opinion, I think it's beautiful that God can love us so much that He can blow us away. The song was originally written, and I don't remember the name, I don't have it here, by a guy that his friend was a youth group leader. And he was praying and praying and praying for revival with his youth group. And he prayed to the Lord, you can take my life, just bring about revival. 
with these children. That night he died in a car wreck. His friend wrote this song to cope with that because he knows even in those circumstances, this affliction that we have in the church that we're reading about, oh, how he loves us. And you see in the church, you don't see envy and jealousy, do you? You see them adoring the love of God even in persecution. Later, David Crowder redid the song, and that's the song that we have today that we hear. And I believe he even put like a big sloppy wet kiss, didn't he, in his version? Am I right? Yep, he put that He put that God reaches down like a big sloppy wet kiss. Ooh, there were a lot of people that didn't like that, and they changed the lyrics because that's sexual. But again, God wants to know us intimately. If you go back to the original words, originally we're supposed to know God the way that we know our spouse. So it's very scriptural. So let's go back in human history, whether you agree with me about the song or not. We'll go back. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. This is one of the top ten, right? Which one is it? You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to worship to, to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. That's commandment number three. He is jealous for me. You may not understand any of the other parts of that. You may not understand how he can p bring about that uh, condemnation on the children. But if we bring up our children in fear and admonition of the Lord, knowing that God loves them so much, you won't have to worry about that, will you? He is jealous for me. He's jealous for my children that they follow after him. And my grandchildren... That's why I told you that my motto verse is that holy fear, Noah built an ark to save his family. In holy fear of God, Alan is going to build an ark to save his family, his grandchildren, his children, his great-grandchildren. He's going to live a life set apart so that they know who God is and how much he loves them. In Exodus 20, verse 17, it's commandment number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. It's a different word than jealous. It's the covet because I don't have what I want. I desire something else. That means I'm not fixed on the first commandment, so am I? That I know that I shouldn't have any other gods before me, that he loves me so much then I won't have to worry about coveting anything else. In fact, I will be happy that my neighbor has what he has. I will see God's blessing on him. Realize that maybe God is blessing him because just like we read in the parables that we're reading and everything, maybe he has a gift to give. So God is giving him more so that he can bless others. We're seeing this in what we're reading in Acts now that they gave to one another so that there were no needy people among them. So let's go back to the beginning and see how envy and jealousy work. In Genesis 3 verse 1 it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. What does that say to me? Touch that one. That's what it says to my human sinful nature. I want what I can't have. The cookie jar is up there, so I climb the shelves, break the cookie jar, and get the cookie, and then when mom asks what happened, I don't know. Right? <clears throat> Satan said... No, or let's go back to verse 3. I don't think I said that. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. If you read back, God didn't say that we know of that was recorded in Genesis, you will die. He told them not to touch. He didn't tell them what the consequences were. Here we find out about the consequences, so we know that the Lord God said those things. 
But that means that Eve knew the consequences. You get that cookie jar and you eat that cookie out of that and you're going to get a spanking, whatever it is. But anyway, I still went after that cookie jar, didn't I? Because I desired that cookie. Now, the thing is, Mom would have gave me that cookie anyway if she wanted to give me that cookie, right? Because she loves me. Oh, how she loves me. But she wants me to be obedient to her because she loves me and wants to protect me. Verse 4, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fr fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, she coveted it. And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now I tell you constantly to train up your children, to write it on the doorposts of your, of your houses and everything. That means you've got to do it. You've got to be reading your Bible. You've got to be studying and meditating on it. You've got to have a prayer life so that they see Christ in you. And then guess what? You've got to live what you read too, don't you? You've got to be a light to the world so that they see it. Because your children are watching you. In the next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Because he coveted the relationship that his brother had with God for doing what was right. Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Jealousy misplaced where it should have been placed with God, being jealous for him because he is jealous for us. Even in punishment because we have sinned against him. He could have taken so many things from us. But instead when we get up in the morning, we have air to breathe, don't we? By the grace of God. He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Enough that He would send His Son to die to put us back into a right relationship with us. But Cain let that jealousy turn to envy and he murdered his brother. So now back to your daily Bible reading. You read through Paul's first missionary journey first. It started in Acts 13 at Antioch. Remember that's the place where they were first called Christians because they were acting like Christ. This was sometime before 50 A.D., 45 to 49 A.D., give or take. In Acts 13, we read, verse 2, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Cilicia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Barnabas was your key character here. At least Luke writes it that way. It was Barnabas and Saul, and they were also with John Mark, and they sailed out to the island of Cyprus. In verse 9, Then Saul, who was also called Paul. I've asked you before, who changed Saul's name to Paul? It was not Jesus. It, Luke changed it in this writing. He was known by two different things. If I go to the bank, because my name is Henry Allen Henson, I'm called Henry. It was even discussed one time with the ladies at the bank. They said, should we call you Henry or Allen? Because we heard at a, at a uh, ministerial worship service, or maybe Thanksgiving dinner, I don't remember where it was. They called you Allen. I said, you call me whatever you want to. They still call me Henry because that's what they're accustomed to. Okay, Luke changes what he calls Saul to Paul. Okay, So Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas from Paphos. Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. How would you like that one, Merle? <laughs> Paul and his companions. Do you think Barnabas was jealous? Yeah, he was jealous for Paul, jealous in a good way. Look how God is going to use him. Let me step aside. Let the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had laid hands on them. Let him go do what he needs to do and be blessed by God for doing it. So it wouldn't have ever led to envy, would it? 
Paul preaches miraculous proof that Jesus is the Messiah. And where does he preach them from? The Old Testament. That's why we went through the Old Testament New Testament last year. And we're going through the New Testament this year. That's what they were doing. Paul was, as he's going along, writing the New Testament. <clears throat> and envy was still there, even though it wasn't between Barnabas and Paul. It was there between the Jewish leaders other than that. Because they were envious that Paul was preaching and taking their people from them. They were converting them. Even though there was miraculous proofs that Jesus was the Messiah. In Acts 13, verse 42 and 43, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, notice the difference, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and the devout converts to Ju Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. Judaism, people were converted. Now, if I look at that wonderfully, I'll say, I don't care where they're going to church as long as they're going to church. Or I can look at it, oh, they went to that other church. Got it? You understand what I'm getting at? Okay. Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God, because if we continue in the grace of God, there won't be any envy creeping in. In the next verse, verses, Paul basically leaves the Jews behind and goes to the Gentiles, just as God had inspired him through the Holy Spirit to do. Chapter 13 ends this way in verse 49 and 50. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, the Great Commission, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook off the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. Now I've got a problem with that scripture. Maybe you do or not. not. The God-fearing women were incited to stir up something. How many times have we been incited because gossip has creeped in, jealousy was lying at our door that turned to envy, to say or do something that we shouldn't have done? And as we can see from this scripture, God's going to use us either way again, whether we're faithful or not. His will is going to happen. But in this case, wow to those who caused other people to stumble. Mm. It would have been better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck, which is big, huge, heavy, sink to the bottom of the sea, than to have caused someone to stumble. Verse 52, at the same time, it says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Those who truly believed Jesus Christ, who said, I will deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after you, were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, so that they could love one another so they could be jealous for God and have jealousy for brothers and sisters in the right, right way where they wouldn't envy, where they would even sell their possessions so that there would be no one with need. What a wonderful vo verse that despite even God-fearing people and persecution, they had joy and they were filled by the Spirit. Is that you? Is that me? Are we filled with joy no matter what? And do we let our light shine? In Acts 14, persecution continues to drive Paul to other places, and the gospel spreads, just as Jesus said he would grow his church. And then verse 22 and 23, they strengthened the believers, and they appointed elders in the churches, so that when they were gone, there were God-fearing men and women there who would uphold and sharpen other Christians. There would be leaders in the church so that the churches would not go astray. And then at the end of Acts 14, you get the end of Paul's first missionary journey. Acts 15, we have the council in Jerusalem. This is somewhere around 50 A.D. And we have a conflict between these believers and those believers, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the Jews and the Greeks. But was there any real conflict? There was some. 
But then when the Holy Spirit got in and we got people talking and sitting down, we decided that there were no differences between Jew and Greek. If God would lay, pour out His Holy Spirit, if He would die for them and then pour out His Holy Spirit, who are we to say that they're any better than us or we're any better than them? We're all God's children. Let's not quarrel among ourselves and be divided, but let's have joy filled with the grace of God, filled with His Spirit to be a light to this world, to be His hands and feet. <clears throat> Second missionary journey begins. Paul and Silas leave out in verses 36 to 41, but there's a little bit of jealousy and envy that creeps in maybe because Barnabas leaves Paul over a dispute with John Mark. What do we get out of that, though? We get John Mark writes his gospel. We don't know what the son of encouragement Barnabas goes on to do. We know what Paul does. So even out of their quarrel, God still is in control. He does His will. Paul and Silas go on. They're introduced to Timothy, to Galatia, to Thessalonica. You're seeing these come up, and you see where the, the, gospel, the letters are written to these churches. If you notice while you're reading, you'll also notice that persecution is still there driving them, but there's a mention that the Holy Spirit is there driving Paul also. Sending him to one place and keeping him from another. So as we let, get past this valley of the shadow of death, we get past these persecutions, we get a chance to be led more, maybe even to some mountaintops. But we've got to get through those persecutions first. In Acts chapter 17, we come across Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. Did you notice about the people in Berea? They were different than the others. They studied the Word of God. That's the Old Testament again, to see if everything that Paul had told them was true or not. And as they studied the Old Testament, as they studied God's Word, they became more and more sanctified because this Word is alive and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. They searched out the Word of God to see about His truth, and they found His love and His peace, and His joy, even from the Old Testament. And they saw that Jesus was, in fact, who He said He was, even from the Old Testament. On Monday, you'll read Acts 18, and you'll see the end of Paul's second missionary journey back in Antioch. That's where you'll be on Monday. Do you remember David's sins? Sure you do. You just, several of them popped in your mind right then. I always like looking at David because he's a breath of fresh air. I hate saying that about him. I'll say it about him when I get to heaven to get a chance to meet him. Because I know how God said also that he was a man after his own heart. That there is no sin too big enough to keep you from the love of God. As long as you repent and turn to him. He is like the best loving earthly father you've ever seen. And then a million times more. He is waiting right there for you to come back into His loving arms where He can pour out His love and His Spirit so much on you it'll be like a hurricane compared to a tree. In Psalm 36, David writes this, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. See, that's the difference. David would have been writing those words about himself, but he's not writing his words, those words about himself here because he has repented and turned to God and God has accepted him. The words of their mouth are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do, and do not reject what is wrong. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the high, highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. Your, you, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink, drink from rivers of delights. For with, with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those 
who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evil doers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. David could have well been on the other side of those words instead on the right side with God. Had he not repented of his sins. Had he not turned to God's love and been jealous for God instead of worrying about the things of this world. He didn't fret over any, his enemies or evildoers. He knew that God was in control and he knew he might have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But God would fill him up to the point where his cup would runneth over. In the next Psalm, verse 39, it says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. Sometimes when we look at the world, we think that the people that are doing the wrong are prospering. Prospering. I'll get it right in a minute. Prospering. Is that best? I think I got it right now. See? It's okay. But don't take your eyes off Jesus. As the author of Hebrews says, which you're going to be getting into in March, fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Don't take your eyes off of Him. Verse 2, Evildoers are like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die. You instead trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. As you're reading along, you should have noticed that the people followed the way. The way of Jesus. They didn't just believe, but they lived differently. Set apart, even to the point of selling their homes and giving so that no one was in need. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I think. I'm not sure. It's Sunday night. And it talks about the collection that they're giving for the saints. And Macedonia is a poor area, but yet they gave so much. And Paul uses that to spur on the Corinthians because they have a lot so that they will give graciously back to the church in Jerusalem who is in need at the time. That we may each be benefited from one another because God has given us barns that are full, full so we can share with those who don't and vice versa. He makes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the righteous and the wicked, the poor and the rich, all by God's grace upon grace upon grace. So one of those churches that we were introduced to was the church in Galatia. So I want to read just a few things from Paul's letter to Galatia. In chapter 5, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery, by that sin which so quickly snares and entangles you. Don't let Satan get one foothold. Verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, do this, serve one another humbly in love. You have every right and every ability in this country to amass castles built on sinking sand. How would I put that? Because if you put them all in all these other things other than in God and the riches He's given you, being rich to one another, especially the family of God, then you're going to be missing out on so many wonderful, wonderful things. You have one life to live. Don't live it foolishly. In between those two verses that I read you is this verse, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor 
uncircumcision has any value. You are no greater than anyone else. The only thing that counts is faith, faith in God, expressing itself how? Through love for one another. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree. That applies to every single person who will accept his love. Does it apply to you and I? Acts 13, 52. At the same time that God-fearing people were persecuting them, the disciples, they were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. They continued to fix their eyes on Jesus, to live a life set apart, to enjoy the peace and joy that comes from knowing Jesus. Later on in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14 to 17, it says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that parable about the Good Samaritan. So the neighbor is anybody you come across. <laughs> it's not the ones you like. It's all neighbors. Love them as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you please. You've been bought with a price. You belong to God Almighty. He bought you back with the blood of Jesus Christ from eternal hell. Whatever you think of hell, it's going to be the opposite of being with God. Just think of it that way. The peace that comes from knowing Jesus, the joy that you have, you will never have. You are not to do whatever you want. You're to do what God has called you to do. Galatians 5, 18 to 25. I'll try it. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. There's no law against this. We won't even need laws. <laughs> the acts of the flesh, they are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy in the wrong form, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, I've already warned you, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the complete opposite, if the Spirit of God lives in you, if you're born again, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you trust in Him, there will be fruit. The fruit of that Spirit will be love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I kind of need to read that one again for myself. Self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking, provoking and envying each other. Let us be jealous for God because He is jealous for us. Let us be jealous for one another with a Christian jealousy that we want them to succeed. We want them to do good. We don't want them to suffer. We don't want them to do without. We love them. We love them as Christ loves one another. That we would be even willing to lay down our lives to bring them to Him. We need to be very careful not to let jealousy lead to envy, leading to whatever. Because when our time is done, then we, were going to have, we will have wasted what God has given us. I don't know about you, but I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to know that I've helped you walk through this world as you've helped me walk through this world. And thank you for doing that. It is a pleasure to be your shepherd.
Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, I thank you that the Spirit is in this place. Lord, may it lead us and guide us, or may He lead us and guide us as we move and have our being in you, that we realize that we are created to worship you. We have been repurchased to live a holy, set-apart life so that we can draw others to you. Lord, we thank you and praise you. We long for the day when Jesus returns. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Increase our faith. Help us when we stumble and fall. Lord, pick us up as we are willing to yield ourselves over to you. Help us face any persecution that comes our way because we know that you're in control of all things and we know that the end of our faith is being with you for all eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.